Welcome back to Body Talk with Bex. This week we have Emma. She has a EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She has a completely different struggle than Charlotte did. And if you haven't listened to that one, go check it out. It's episode number 47. And then take a listen to this one as both both people have a completely different representation of symptoms and just their everyday life and struggles. And Emma is part of the Champion Health Agency, which Anya started, and she was also on the show, episodes 26 and 27, if you want a little bit more about what Champion Health Agency is and what they do. And with that, let's just jump right on in. I was born in Texas, but I, my family's military, so we moved here when I was a baby and haven't left, luckily. Gotcha. So it's my hometown. <laughs> gotcha. And so I guess you're one of the lucky ones where you actually have like decent health insurance then, at least when you were a kid. Yes. And yeah. it's been a bit of an interesting path trying to find like disability routes this way now because originally we thought through TRICARE and my dad and VA we'd find a way in that way but it looks like we're still gonna have to go through the regular route and hopefully still keep a lot of my same doctors but you know that will be interesting to see right that could be a toss-up okay so you're at the age then where you're getting ready to switch insurances that's so scary Yes, I'm 25, so right on that cusp. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that when I was 25. I was having, like, full-blown panic attacks, trying to figure out what I was going to (laughs) do. Yes, yes. (laughs) Trying to research everything, but, like, the information's just not easily accessible, I guess. So it's hard Mm -hmm. to figure out on your own. And then the information out there is a lot of horror stories of like I've been fighting for years and years and legal battles so of course that's always fun to see that this could be what I'm going through but hopefully not uh, ease your nerves shall we say (laughs) yes (laughs) well um let's jump in then to your story because you have from what I remember reading on your she's Emma is part of the Champion Health Agency, which is yes. I'm part of through through Anya. Mm-hmm. So I know looking at your bio, you have all kinds of stuff going on and Yeah, with Ellie's Danlos, there's there's lots of comorbidities and it's just been a process getting a diagnosis, which it is for a lot of people, of course, but just that journey of one figuring out what even was wrong and then to all the things that could be wrong within that (laughs) but yeah it really started when I was born actually which we didn't you know have the information back then to put any of this together until I was much later in life but when I was born I had like four different heart problems I had a PDA a muscle bundle wrapped around my lower chambers a hole in one chamber and my carotid artery on the left was a third of the size on my right and it was weird because like I was my parents told me this story and I was just taken out of the room to go be washed off and laid down and stuff there's just so happened to be a cardiologist walking past the nursery and saw that I was turning blue and it was just like a a moment of like, oh, we need to get to her and help her and fix what's going on, see what's going on. And so a lot of that resolved on its own. I didn't have to have any surgeries as a baby, thankfully. But growing up, I did have like a heart murmur and stuff. Nothing that ever stopped me from doing sports or being a very active kid. In fact, I did like soccer and swim and track and dance and then landed on rowing finally. But So I was always pretty active and clumsy through all of my years. And that's, we like to say it's part of EDS, but it's not necessarily a criteria. Of course, it's just spatial awareness is not my strong suit and I bruise easily and my skin is very fragile. But then in middle school, around 
say 14, 13, I started rowing and I loved that sport and thought I would be able to continue it through the, like throughout my entire life, honestly, but it's also a very hard sport on your body and your joints. And when I was about 15, 16, I started to have a knee pain, which was really disguised hip pain. And I went to see an orthopedic surgeon and they were like, oh, you've torn your labrum. We need to repair this and have surgery. And it was actually due to FAI, femoral acetabular, acetabular impingement syndrome, which is basically just your ball and socket joint don't fit properly and they impinge a lot and so my labrum was getting stuck and whenever I was rowing and then it just kind of severed it and so my surgeon luckily through the military was very good and knowledgeable and was a former rower as well but I was also his first EDS patient later in life like I've seen him now several times and it's been an interesting journey seeing what he's learned so back then I didn't know I had EDS. I just had, you know, random aches and pains growing up. I thought it was growing pains or, you know, I thought everybody felt this way at times. So it wasn't a big deal. It didn't like alert me that anything was going on until maybe my third surgery. So after the first surgery on my hip, I was recovering, trying to get back into rowing and doing physical therapy. And then my lower back started to hurt. And so I saw a different orthopedic just specialist and they decided to do a discectomy because of a bulging disc. Mm -hmm. And so that was on L5 S1 at 17 years old. And um, after that, again, trying to get back into rowing and doing physical therapy to try and get back, uh, my right hip started to hurt. So a different hip from before. Yes, sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask just because I haven't heard this term, a discectomy. Discectomy? Discectomy. It's it's where they essentially go in and remove parts of the disc to try and like stop from it bulging out onto nerves and stuff. Okay. So it's not a it wasn't a complete discectomy, which is when they can remove the entire disc, but for me it was just trying to fix the pain which it didn't really but also i've un- i've come to understand with back surgeries and surgeries in general you're gonna have different aches and pains afterwards yeah. which um yeah okay but, i just wanted to get a clarification on that <laughs> yeah no problem sorry if i'm going fast too sorry, so then getting back into well, rowing. yes i was getting back into rowing still and just physical therapy I hadn't even really picked back up on the sport and like gotten back in a boat or anything but my right hip started to hurt and it turns out I had torn it in physical therapy I torn my right labrum in physical therapy and so then I needed another uh, labrum repair on that and I got it done by a different doctor at this point because I had aged out of my pediatrician in the military and needed to go see someone, a civilian doctor. And they, it was just somebody else and they were a good surgeon, but years down the line, I also retore it and got it refixed by the same surgeon from before in the military. And he did a really good job because he had prior knowledge about EDS at that point and haven't had problems with my hips since. But so that was my third surgery at 18 and I finally decided to give up trying to go back to rowing, even though I was very stubborn and really wanted to, especially because I thought, it was, oh, here's my ride to college and all this other stuff. But so while I went off to college that year at 18, I went to the University of Alabama, which is two states away. So I was away from home and away from all my doctors, but struggling to like stay and try and get through school the best I can. And Freshman year was honestly probably one of my better years at school, but I still came home and was having a lot of lower back pain that summer. And they decided, my pain doctors and I came to the decision to get a spinal cord stimulator implanted. And so that was a device to try and focus on taking my pain away instead of using any kind of 
medications if I couldn't access them being two states away. So having this device, it was very interesting because there was a trial run basis and the trial, I felt like maybe it gave me some relief and we were still grasping at straws of like, I don't even know what's wrong with me. We think it's just like all structural issues, nothing underlying still. And so we went ahead and got it. I said the trial helped me enough to get it fully implanted and I started using it, but I noticed right around the same time I started taking, I was prescribed gabapentin, which is also a, I think it's, I know it's a nerve drug, but it would make it so that with, in combination with the spinal cord stimulator, I really couldn't feel my legs that well. And I was walking from my apartment to class to and from school and I would fall a lot. And so I was like, well, I can't really do this <laughs> either. So I stopped using the stimulator and eventually got off of gabapentin. But the stimulator wasn't a cure-all for my pain like we had really hoped it would be. So that was a major surgery at 19. <laughs> and then at 20, I tore my right hip again, my leg room and my right hip again, just randomly at school. I don't really know how I did it, but it was interesting because I came home from school and like went to see my doctor the week I got home and it was like a Friday and he was like I don't know how you how you have been walking around on this like this should be extremely painful we're gonna get you into surgery on Monday and so by Monday it was repaired and I started feeling better and I'm very thankful for that but it's also just insane how like I didn't even notice that it had torn necessarily I knew I was in pain for sure but it was something that I was still moving around on just fine and was like, well, what do I do with this? And that is also around the time that I got my Ehlers-Danlos diagnosis. It was after that surgery. So while I was recovering from that, I was seeing a bunch of specialists and we had kind of landed on, me and my mom had kind of landed on a self-diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, a similar connective tissue disorder, um, because I have what people would call Marfanoid habitus. I look pretty tall and lanky. I'm 6'1". I have like a wingspan of 6'7". Um, just, yeah, <laughs> um, just <laughs> interesting proportions, <laughs> but so we had looked all around and I was meeting some of this criteria for that on Google. So I was like, and doctors up until now had been like, your, your tests have been coming back fine. We don't know what's wrong with you. I'd been to rheumatologists, cardiologists, all the like neurologists, all these different people and nobody was really helping me. And so I saw a geneticist and he pretty much sat me down and we talked about what I thought I had. And he looked at me after I gave him, you know, a whole long story about my family history, medical history, and what I thought I had. And he was like, I'm pretty sure you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Have you heard of that? And I was like, no, I, I hadn't even heard of Marfan syndrome until I started researching myself. And he said, you know, it's not, he said, it's not a new or rare disease, which was interesting to me at the time because from later what I researched it, lots of conflicting articles saying oh it is rare or it's not because I have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome which is one of the less rare ones or more common ones and he said it's just underdiagnosed and a lot of people a lot of doctors it's there they get one slide in school about it instead of like a whole lesson or whole book or anything about it so they get one slide on it and then keep going and it's just kind of a blip on the radar i find that so ridiculous because there's so many different kinds of eds mm -hmm. i yeah. mean i researched eds before because i had a, an interview with a different eds person and mm -hmm. it's ridiculous how many different kinds there are and the fact that it's not well researched and taught anywhere is just absolutely mind-blowing to me mm -hmm. and they all overlap too which is interesting like I have probably a grab bag I would say of different comorbidities but a lot of those comorbidities overlap in different ones so like the vascular one I'm sure you'll see pots more of 
and more cardiac cardiovascular symptoms, which I do have a lot of, but also not as much as not enough to get me into that category. And not that I would want to be in that category necessarily, but, but just, yeah, it is interesting seeing how it's just not heard of. Cause then I was like, okay, now I have this diagnosis from this geneticist. I can go and tell people about it and they'll look at me with a new understanding. And that did not happen at all. It was still a fight to teach people what it was and get people to listen that it's actually a real thing. Even And before I had at around 18, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And around that time, fibromyalgia was still very much looked down upon and seen as like this made up, uh, it's all in your head type of, if there's nothing else going on, we can just throw this diagnosis on somebody from what I saw and, or from the people that I had seen, the attitudes I had seen about it and just horrible. But I've now come to see that Alex Danlos is getting a lot of those same attitudes or has had a lot of those same attitudes. Like I saw the other day on TikTok, even somebody called it the TikTok disease, EDS. And I was like, no. it's not just something people go on here and talk about for no reason. Like it's a real thing. But yeah, so after about, after 20, I was getting all my diagnoses of like, struggling to find what else was wrong with me, just comorbidity. So I got a diagnosis for POTS, mast cell, brain nods, chronic migraines, endometriosis, and celiac, which is really interesting actually about my diagnosis with celiac is growing up, I always hated the taste of bread and wheat. I would always be like, this tastes too much, like too much wheat in a cake or cookies or something that obviously had flour in it, but if it was sweeter and masked it, I would be like, okay, maybe I'll eat it. But I just always hated it. And people were like, all right, that's weird. Why don't you eat bread? <laughs> but then I finally got diagnosed at 21 with um, celiac and it all kind of clicked that, oh, this has been a lifelong thing for me. It's just not some like other people haven't been feeling like this their whole life. You have other things going on with you. But because of celiac at 21, I was still in college and eating a college kid's diet, which is not very healthy or substantial. <laughs> I was eating a lot of Uncrustables for dinner, but that's obviously bread. And so during my sophomore year, in my junior year, I had lost a bunch of weight and my battery pack of my stimulator, which had been untouched really for the past two years, was in my lower back, like above my butt, where before I had enough like cushioning necessarily fat to cover it and it wouldn't stick out. But then because I lost so much weight before I got diagnosed with celiac from eating a bunch of bread, I needed to move the battery pack around to the front in my abdomen because it was sticking out and getting caught on external things that weren't in a part of my body and it was hurting a lot and, you know, bruising and all this other issues. So that was just another surgery I had from then I went on to leave school in 2019 and COVID hit shortly after, you know, 2020 and while I was home through 2019 and 2020, I started, you know, getting serious about seeing more doctors and getting just a treatment plan in place because going back and forth to school, I didn't really have a solid treatment plan. It was just kind of like treat what you can if it comes up, but like try not to let anything come up because you're just states away. And that, that was just how it worked out. It wasn't like anybody saying that to me necessarily. It was just hard to juggle being states away from my whole team of doctors at, that I was just now getting to know and getting acquainted with. But then I had at 21, I had a heart monitor implanted. Yeah. At 21 in 2020, I had a heart monitor implanted just to check out and make sure I didn't have any other cardiovascular symptoms going on because of the overlaps and to make sure I didn't have cardiovascular EDS because 
while there are genetic tests out there for some of the types with hypermobile, there isn't a gene that is known what causes it. So I have not personally ever had a genetic test. I've just been diagnosed off of my family medical history. And like I have other family members with connective tissue disorders and, you know, how I presented, but this was just a way to rule it out without having to check a genetic test because a lot of them are expensive out of pocket and TRICARE does not cover any of them. So then after that, at 23, I had my endometriosis surgery. Then at 24, I got my spinal cord stimulator removed and because finally was not using it and just wanted it out. And now I'm 25 and trying to avoid having a pain pump surgery this year. So I've just had a surgery every year since I was 16, pretty much. That's a lot of different things to have to think about. Yeah. And of course, I've had hospitalizations and stuff in between. But I say the surgeries are probably the most taxing thing that have been a part of my diagnosis journey. Yeah, well, I mean, those those take a lot out of you. Yeah, just recovering from one in a year and then turning around and having to say, oh, let's do another. Yeah, that's really hard on your body. Can you talk a little bit about some of these different things that you have? So I know like we kind of just breezed over like you have Mm -hmm. fibromyalgia, you have POTS. You talked a little bit about celiac. Do you mind going back and kind of talking about some of the symptoms that you deal with from some of the different things that you have? Yeah. So especially growing up, me and my mom were actually talking the other day about symptoms that I maybe experienced as a little kid and didn't realize could have been EDS or just one of my many comorbidities. But I remember eating school lunches growing up in elementary school and a lot of those probably had wheat in them because they weren't celiac friendly and they still aren't. But they, I would, every day around lunchtime, I'd have a stomach ache. And then in the afternoons, I'd get a headache. And my mom would always just be like, oh, you know, it's probably because you waited to eat lunch or you skipped breakfast or whatever and headaches because you're dehydrated after playing from recess or allergies down here in Florida. We just talked it up to a whole handful of things that weren't serious and of course at the time it was just a little stomach ache a little headache but now looking back those are the symptoms i get right after i eat gluten or if i accidentally eat gluten now so i think back then that's probably what it was but i also was being told that oh you know everybody can get a headache from being dehydrated or anybody could get a headache from like not eating enough or not eating healthy enough so I was like, well, this is something that just kind of reinforced in my head that this is something everyone goes through and not specific to me, not specific to anything going on. So that's celiac specific. One thing with mast cell disease, mast cell activation syndrome, I should say, MCAS that I also have. I have a story from a rowing regatta when I was a teenager. We were doing wet launches, which is when you will walk, you have to carry the boat overhead and walk down into the water and then roll it over and like get in so we were at this lake here in jacksonville florida and they're not the cleanest waterways so doing wet launches i came out of the water one day and this is in february so the water's cold here to me it's freezing which i'm sure it's not really but we got out of the water and after a race and my legs were really blotchy and red and looked kind of like a rash but my coaches were so worried. They're like, they called over the ambulance and they gave me a shot of Benadryl because they thought I was just having an allergic reaction to something in the water. And I always had sensitive skin, which is also mast cell, but it was probably just more so Raynaud's or a combination of both from the cold of the, like the temperature change of being cold, but also like having just raced in all the blood flow in my legs and circulation issues. And so it wasn't necessarily an allergic reaction, but it presented similar enough that it freaked everyone out and it was this whole big thing. And I was always the kid on the rowing team, like out in in the like marshy areas getting, oh, my eyes swelling up because of pollen or like just allergic reactions to random stuff. But always that kid that had something wrong with me and was also 
why I thought I was so clumsy and just, uh, I don't know, just <laughs> silly, I guess. But yeah, I always was nicknamed clumsy growing up, like clumsy one who was always in the ER as a kid because I'd fall, but like it was never just a simple enough fall. I'd always and scrape your knee. It was like I'd fall and then dislocate my thumb, which now I know I, what a dislocation really is. And I mean, back then when I'd experienced it, I did too, but now I know how to get the dislocation back in without going to the hospital and without, you know, it becoming a huge deal as well. And knowing that they come and go for me a whole lot more than they do for other people, just because of Ellers Danlos and the way it presents with affecting my collagen and it makes it so that all of my joints are more lax and hypermobile, of course, but that means that the rest of my body is working extra hard to try and keep them in place. And so I guess also because I was lucky because I was an active kid, I was never super out of shape in that sense of where I couldn't rely on my muscles to keep my joints in place. And now that I've stopped rowing after college and everything stopped being super, super active, I have noticed that I mean, also aging, but I have noticed that my joints are, take, it's taking a toll, you know, it is a little bit harder to keep moving at the same pace. Yeah, that makes sense. That's funny. I've not heard any stories about rainoids like that before. Yeah, I've had it, especially where like my toes go purple or blue randomly in my doctor's office appointments because I'm always wearing flip-flops down here. But so they'll literally see it and be like, oh, that's weird. Or see it growing up and be like, oh, that's weird. And now I have something that I can be like, oh, it's it's Raynaud's or it's this or I have at least an answer to these things. Whereas before I was actually talking to another friend the other day about how in middle school and high school, I'd always complain about having all these different doctor's appointments and like taking all these medical tests and then coming back normal and me just going, I kind of wish something was wrong with me. I wish they would come back abnormal. So I would know what it, what, like have an explanation. Right. But, it does help. Even if there's no like treatment or cure for it. Yeah. With it. With EDS, the really, the treatment plan is just treat your symptoms. It's not like, of course, there is research being done to figure out the genes and everything in it, but I don't think there's much in a way of a cure, at least not yet. Right, right. And I'm, I'm curious too, have you ever tried any of the, the like, you can get pills to help with processing wheat? Have you ever tried any of those? I really want to. I was looking at them too the other day on Amazon, but I haven't tried them just because a lot of the pages I'm on for celiac people say that they'll help with your symptoms, but nothing is really going to stop that like gut destruction that it's doing to your insides instead of like you just might not notice it. It's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on an issue, which, you know, taking pain medicine could be looked at as the same thing, but if I'm in pain, I'm still going to grab something to take that pain away. Something ibuprofen, you know? So yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a band aid on it and sticking it on there, especially when I'm having, you know, a bad migraine and stomach reaction to having accidentally ingested gluten. I just have not tried it yet. Okay. I found them helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I have, like, I used to get super bloated and like lots of stomach pains and things like that whenever I had too much gluten. And I started mm-hmm. taking it up whenever I eat gluten to like make the decision to eat. Like, yeah, I'm going to have pizza. Mm-hmm. And it's not gluten free crust or whatever. Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll take a pill before I eat and I wind up not feeling bloated all evening. And wow, that so, is amazing. I find it does help, but you're right, it could just be treating the symptoms and not actually like. But again, hey, who's to say that that's not what you need? And that moment is just the symptom relief. I mean, if you like eating pizza as much as I do, (laughs) it winds up being worth it. So 
Yes, especially because the gluten-free pizzas I've tried are not, they're missing the mark a little bit. <laughs> have you tried the cauliflower crust ones? I have. I'm not the biggest fan of cauliflower, but I found some good, like, thin crust. I like the really crispy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I just found a cauliflower one that I like because I never really liked cauliflower growing up either or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a little uh, suspicious of a cauliflower crust pizza, but I did find one recently that I like. So mm -hmm. I recently found too that there's some new like gluten free doughs on the market for pizza crust dough that you can just make at home. And so you just buy like a bag of enough to make one or two. And I thought that was cool because I had not seen something like that yet, which it's interesting too, because gluten-free has always been like seen as such a fad diet. I remember as a kid being told like, oh, if I shy away from eating pizza or bread on a certain day or sandwiches or cupcakes, whatever, at a party, um, the parents and other kids would look at me and be like, are you on a diet? Like, what is, why are you shying away from this? Like, this is good. And I'm like, I just... Is, it doesn't taste good to me, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that too, I think back and see how intuitive my body was knowing that it wasn't like in my mind, it was just the taste. I didn't like the taste. I didn't notice a whole lot of the symptoms being related to that as a kid, but I talked it all up to the taste. And that was also my body telling me, Hey, this isn't good for you. Like, don't eat this. Yeah. And so do you just kind of try to avoid gluten at this point? Yes. Yeah, I try to avoid it completely. Um, I have had moments of indulgence where I'm like, oh, I really want to try a bite of whatever someone else in my family is eating. It's hard because I am the only gluten free person in my family and amongst any of my like close friends in town. But everybody's also very accommodating of like finding a place to eat for me or just including like making a meal inclusive but it's just also like wow there aren't as many options it's almost like being vegan or vegetarian there aren't as many options and the options out there are like fakes of something that was originally out there and it's also three times as expensive <laughs> so and you've noticed with like abstaining from gluten like all of the symptoms don't arise <laughs> yes honestly I can say it's made it easier because I've also had stomach problems like SIBO, small intestinal, intestinal bacteria overload. Yes. But I got diagnosed with that the first time right around when I got diagnosed with celiac. And I thought all my stomach issues were the same thing and really sticking to a gluten-free diet. I've had SIBO again a few times and you just take an uh, antibiotic or in my experience, I've taken antibiotics and it's cleared it up rel relatively easy, but it's been easier to tell like, oh, now I feel when this is coming on instead of just like, my stomach feels like this all the time. And I can't really decipher what's making it feel like this. I tried a bunch of elimination diets and like all these other things to begin with while still on the journey of figuring out before I even knew I had EDS. So lots of those, I still couldn't decipher what was what because I still felt the same the whole time. Right. So. Yeah. And then you mentioned it, but just kind of breezed past it. You also have endometriosis. Yes. I recently had surgery for that two years ago and they said I was stage three endometriosis at the time which I've always had very bad, you know, periods, time of the month for women and people with uteruses. But it's just, it was also something that I was like, oh, you know, certain women just can have really bad, painful periods and cramps and bleeding and irregularness. So I didn't think I was experiencing any experiencing anything outside of the norm I was like okay this is just inside this bubble of what it could be like I'm getting a shitty deal a shitty end of the deal but it's also like it's what I'm experiencing so I never knew that until I had seen my third gynecologist at 23 and she diagnosed me with actually it was my 
GI doctor after I got in diagnosed with celiac and SIBO and was still having lots of bouts of throwing up and cramps, st- stomach cramps and stuff, but it was pretty cyclical. And she was like, you know, a lot of my patients that have celiac and ehlers Danlos also have endometriosis. And when we've exhausted a lot of the other things, we look at that because if you're still having these issues, maybe it's that. So I went to see a different gynecologist and they diagnosed me with endo after doing some tests and ultrasounds and all that. And then I had a surgery from a specialist and also had a nerve cut to try and help with cramping in the future. Forget exactly what that part of the surgery was, but it was the nerve that runs to your uterus that will like send signals to your brain to like cramp down there. And it was just part, something that he said was part of what he liked to do because for people who already experienced very painful periods, it tended to help them. But I found great success after that surgery. And, you know, I still have some very bad months, I will say, but I'm not having it to where every month I'm puking and can't get out of bed and other issues like that. You're able to live life again. (laughs) Yes, pretty much. Yes. Which is huge. (laughs) Oh, yes. Like nothing that birth control had ever given me, which is. It, it's always promised, oh, this m- could help you. This could help you, but. Wow, that's such an interesting insight that that doctor had that celiac, EDS, and endo seem to be like commonly found together. Yeah, it's just another one on the list of comorbidities out there, but of course, not everyone is going to have. Everyone, I feel like, just gets a grab bag and uh, every. Ellers Danlos patient gets a grab bag of what you could have and you just kind of pick out a handful out and see oh well the main trifecta I'd say is POTS, mast cell, and Ellers Danlos that's what most people say but lots of people also have the Raynaud's and migraines and endo and fibromyalgia and other things like that so you got everything from both those grab bags <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> took a big handful yeah so how does let's talk about your fibromyalgia for a little bit Mm -hmm. Uh, how what how does that present itself for you I'd say it's just the widespread spread pain you know I got that diagnosis back in back when I was still a teenager and was undiagnosed with Ehlers Danlos. So I don't know how much of my pain is necessarily chalked up to fibromyalgia or just Ehlers Danlos or a combination of the two, because I do know you can have both. It's also comorbidity, but a lot of my pain is also joint pain. And I found with my spinal cord stimulator, like maybe that was a good pain relief for like, my muscles and my nerves, but not my joints and my bones, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I was still having a lot of joint pain, even with the spinal cord stimulator. So I was like, what's even the point? Like I'm still experiencing subluxations, which are minor dislocations and it's not fixing that pain. So why should I even use this? I'm still experiencing this daily. And now I know why I'm experiencing that at least is the Ehlers Danlos and what I can do for that is try and strengthen the muscles around it and wear braces to help keep everything in place and stuff like that. Okay. So you wear braces, you try to work out those muscles. Do you use a cane or anything? I use a cane and I use canes on days where I know I'll have a lot of walking or days where like where I want to go out and maybe it's not a lot of walking but I want to wear heels or something that I know will tire me out two times as fast but I still really want to do it so let me just grab my cane I even have a walker and a wheelchair but I don't typically like using those and also don't use them as much but 
just because I am still young and want to present as young and healthy for the most part, because it is, even though I do consider myself disabled, it's hard to present that. Yes. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it takes a lot too to even think about like, what am I doing today? What can I do to protect myself today from having symptoms? So (laughs) even just having anything at the ready, that mindset even is a huge step. Yeah. Yeah. And like in Florida, even wearing braces in the summertime, it's so hot. It's a struggle to be like, okay, do I want to protect myself today or do I want to sweat all day? Right. But, Does that cause yeah. rashes at all? Or have you had that happen? I definitely have had rashes just from some of the material on different braces, but also the trapped sweat. And like, I, I already have a hard time regulating my own temperature because of dysautonomia and which is whole umbrella term for like pots and mast cell but yeah so already have all these issues that just make them so much more fun to deal with each other (laughs) right have you found any tricks for helping with that not with temperature dysregulation at all honestly one of the main things that has helped was something that i've noticed was i take chromalin for my mast cell which is a liquid and it helps my pot symptoms it seems to which out dysautonomia in cases both and so a lot of their symptoms overlap with pots and mass cell like temperature just regulation is a symptom of both so i don't know which is the cause of it necessarily but something's helping so i'm just like okay <laughs> that works yeah and is that is the temperature dysregulation the only symptom that you feel from POTS or are there other things that you notice as well? So with POTS, a lot of the things that I chalk up to POTS, the symptoms that I chalk up to it are like when I stand up too fast or when I stand up at all and my vision goes black and I feel like I'm going to faint in times I have fainted or when I take a shower that's a little warmer than you know normal and then I'm sweating and feeling like I'm gonna pass out feeling like I just ran a race when all it is is it's a little hot or stepping outside here in Florida honestly with the humidity and heat some days it feels like wow did I just run a race or did I walk outside <laughs> but yeah it's more so those like circulation issues I'd say too like my feet and hands are always freezing and slightly different colored than the rest of me because of that my veins are also very prominent I'd say like in my chest you can see the green veins throughout so and translucent skin which I think that's just allergistamos instead of pots EDS thing that I've read about yeah yeah but I I say they're all kind of under that umbrella of pots yeah and I know Pot disease usually involves a lot of the like thoracic and that kind of like spine area. Do you, is that, do you think the root of a lot of your spinal problems or is that related to something else? I'm not sure. I know I do have dis- degenerative disc disease and arthritis, not osteoarthritis, but just arthritis or not rheumatoid arthritis, just osteoarthritis. But a lot of my back problems, I'd say, are probably dis- just disc-related. Like, I know I have four bulging herniated discs and two discs that are completely gone. So I think that's where a lot of my lumbar pain is from. But even with, like, the spinal cord stimulator where they had it placed the cords, the leads onto like my upper back. So it would give me pain relief up into my, up into my upper body some, not into my arms at all, but it would still give me pain relief pretty high up or like that numbing sensation. I wouldn't call it actual pain relief, but it was like a distraction, almost a distractive sensation and so that would reach pretty high up, but it still didn't take away that spinal 
pain, that spinal column pain. And a lot of the time I feel like my spinal column is just like shifting around uh, willy nilly. It's not very stable feeling, which I think that causes my pain a lot. Yeah. Okay. So let's kind of move a little bit away from talking about symptoms and things, but let's talk a little bit like what your daily routines look like. I, I have a lot of family members and things like that out there to people who listen to the show. And sometimes it's an eye opener for them to realize like what people like us have to think about when we're getting ready for our day or just all of the different things that we have to do to take care of ourselves. Yeah, most days I'd say I wake up depending on the time usually depends how I slept that night because I do have a lot of pain somnia. But I'll wake up in the mornings and first things first, I usually check my barometer app and my weather app to see what's in store for my joints that day, even though they will tell me if it's raining or if it's going to rain because of the changes in pressure. But it's always nice to know a little heads up if I do need to grab some braces and just bring them with me or put them on immediately, then get up, take all of my medications first thing so I hopefully don't forget with my brain fog which is a decent handful of pills and for my various comorbidities and then try and get started doing whatever it is that day during the weeks I usually have appointments three days out of the five I see different specialists and stuff and that's not every week but on a week where it's the most, I'd say probably four days out of five. And the week where I don't have any appointments is like a great week for me. But I typically have at least one to three appointments a week. And a lot of my time is spent traveling to and from appointments. Jacksonville is not a very close knit city in, in terms of space. So traveling to a doctor's appointment, spending however long in there talking to the doctor and then driving home that takes up a lot of my day. And then my afternoons, I have started a small business where I make jewelry and plant related accessories, because I'm very into plants. That's one of my hobbies that keeps me busy as well, when I don't have doctor's appointments. But so I usually do that in the afternoons and evenings to help keep me busy and like, keep up with crafts and it's just given me something to do and also some income to help with doctor's appointments and medications and things of that nature. But yeah, that's, a, and then I'd say at night, take my medication around 12, which is kind of late, but it usually will put me in bed by like 1230. And then hopefully I sleep throughout the night. But most of the time I wake up toss and turn because I'm a side sleeper and I'll dislocate my shoulder or hip if I sleep on a side for too long. And then I wake up and got to flip and uh, wake up every couple hours and do that all night long. Wow. So that's a typical day for me. That's a lot. I'm, I'm glad that you added in the bit about crafting and things like that because that was my next question was like mm -hmm. how do you even have time to work yeah what I mean what's going on in your life like and I have tried keeping jobs throughout like college and high school of course which it's not been easy especially needing to take off time for surgeries not not a lot of employers are very understanding about those things especially doctor's appointments even they're like you need to go to how many are you sure you're not lying but yeah, I just recently got into it. Of course, with the 2020 quarantine, I got into plants a little bit, being stuck at home, which is nothing new to me being stuck at home, like, oh, <laughs> against my will. But then I got into plants and like really tried to beautify my house and living space and backyard with plants and it gives me something to do every day as well of like something to take care of like i have a pet dog too but yeah you know, he's whatever compared to my plants no <laughs> something to take care of every day and like look forward to and add beauty to my space without like a big commitment of if i miss one or two days in a row 
they're not all going to die on me or they're all not just going to completely poof. <laughs> yeah. Did you make what's on the wall behind you? I didn't. I made part of it from my garden, but the macrame part, I didn't. I do try to branch out and do a lot of different craft styles, like clay crafts, love painting, love jewelry making, but it's, I don't really stick with one thing for too long. I feel like I'm love to start a bunch of different projects and then see what, see what I like the most, see what turns out good. Well, you're figuring out what you enjoy the most. Yeah. Yeah. Like my mom has always been crafty too. And my grandma used to paint. She's the one who taught me oil paints and acrylics. And my mom has taught me to crochet a bit. And other than that, I've just learned as I went along and picked up something that I was like, oh, this looks cool. I want to make that. Fun. Yeah. And I realized too, that we talked about, you went to college in Alabama, but did I assume you graduated and I have not actually. I took two medical leaves of absence while I was there because of one of the surgeries fell at the end of a semester and I needed I wasn't able to finish out one semester. But anyways, uh towards the end of twenty nineteen when I was leaving and before COVID hit right away, COVID is what prevented me from coming back because Alabama is obviously interesting state and um, the school itself did not have any type of precautions in place and they really didn't even want to allow work from home work like school from home a lot of time and I was already doing a lot of online classes while I was there because that was accommodations that I needed while I was there but fighting for accommodations at the school was an uphill battle and then COVID hit and I was just like, I don't really want to go back there specifically. And yeah. then in the meantime, since I've also been having lots of surgeries or at least same surgeries every year, but just like focusing on my health and making sure that when I do go back to school, because that is a big goal of mine to get my degree in something, it was originally psychology, but now when I do go back, I just want to make sure I don't have to take another medical leave of absence because that's something that always really just put a damper on how I viewed school and my motivation for it and all of that. So I want to make sure when I go back, I can do my best and all of that. Yeah. Are you looking at schools closer to home then? Yes. Uh, there are a few community colleges that I know I could pick up because I did one of them in high school when I was um, doing dual enrollment so I could always go back to that one but of course there are plenty of schools around Florida as well that I've kind of looked at good yeah yeah and I think you have the right mindset of like make sure you're ready to go back and you have everything in order and yes yeah yeah so I guess my one of my last topics that I want to talk about is, and, and I know this is a hard one for some people to talk about or they just kind of brush it off, is that you have a lot of things that manifest like physically. I mean, mm -hmm. I have lots of scars from all the surgeries you've had. You know, you get the splotchiness from the rhinoids. <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, I'm sure even walking with a cane can sometimes, you know, not be your favorite thing. Mm -hmm. How do you handle all of the self-image issues that arise from all of that? It's not the easiest, of course. You know, I found that there's a lot of grief that comes with disability, chronic illness in general. And it's just like, it's like a constant uh, cycle of grief of like, one day I feel very confident and enough to go out and face, you know, all the stairs with my cane or with braces or that come with parking in a handicap spot and being berated, you know, things of that nature. But there's some days that the grief hits harder and it's not as easy to face those. I'm going to assume as well that you have a strong support system of people 
yes, I do have my family who I live with currently. And, you know, my mom is a very strong advocate for me. And even though I love to self-advocate, there are days that my medical trauma even rears its head. So she comes to most, if not all of my appointments with me to help be there and be support. And then the rest of my family has done a lot of education about EDS for themselves and just helps me out daily. So that's really sweet. Yeah. What would you say to anyone who is struggling with their self image due to medical things? Like, if you were a really good day, what would you tell them? I would say that everything comes in waves. So, at the highest peak of one wave, it might be, it might feel like you're drowning a bit or you don't have any grasp, but things will melt out and you will resurface. And yeah, things will look up. Self esteem is also something that's like an ongoing journey. So it's not something that you have to like come to once and stick at you can go through motions of times where you're you're most confident and times where you're you're least confident but you will also have those median times in between so i think just knowing that nothing is permanent that way is something to keep in mind i like that because it's very true. It's an up and down road. Yeah. I mean, magically days, get day. <laughs> days where you feel good, it's easy to be like, ah, oh, I'm on top of the world and I'm doing great. And then the next day it comes crashing down if you overdid something or somebody looks at you funny because you're using a mobility aid or whatever. But just also don't try to dwell on that because again, you don't know what's coming around the corner or what tomorrow looks like. So. Right. So yeah, looking on positives and looking forward, you have all kinds of your crafts and things. You've got your goal for going back to college at some point. Yes. Anything else positive going on in your life that you want to end talking on? Aside from being new in the champion community, I'm very excited for that and I feel like I've been wanting to do more advocacy work in and of itself more so than just like posting online which is advocacy in and of itself too it's important as well but more so than just reposting other people's work I want to contribute myself and so I'm very excited to be a part of this and to be a part of your podcast as well and I thank you for having me on yeah no it's been a pleasure talking to you and hearing about everything and I can't believe everything that you're you know dealing with and it's a lot it's a lot for one person to handle so thank you yeah Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Body Talk with Bex. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts at. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and share with anyone that you think could benefit from listening. Also consider becoming a patron on patreon.com. And don't forget I send out monthly emails with all of the resources that are talked about in any of the episodes will be linked in those emails so if you know anyone who is struggling with anything and needs assistance there's resources available that you will be getting right to your inbox and if you would like to share your story or know someone who does i can be contacted through my website www.bodytalkwithbex.com or on social media And I really hope you enjoyed this episode with Emma. I really think it was a fantastic representation of how disabilities can take shape in any any way, even in young people. And that, you know, when someone parks in a disabled spot, you don't know what they're going through. Don't judge. 
don't give them crap for parking there. You never know. They may really actually have a disability that you can't see and are suffering. So just remember, it can happen to anyone. And uh, thanks for listening.